Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of Trial Day 13 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cups, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. Before court started today and the jury was present, the defense asked to make a statement about what happened in court yesterday. You'll remember that yesterday, Allison McCabe testified and broke down in describing the harassment she and her family had suffered as a result, she said, of the defense allegations or insinuations that Colin Albert was suspicious or had something to do with what happened to John O'Keefe. The defense renewed their objection to the line of questioning that led to her breaking down and requested the judge to strike that portion of her testimony and tell the jury to disregard it. They argued that the defense did not open the door to that subject in the slightest. They simply asked her, like they asked all the other witnesses, when she had first when she had first spoken with the state police. They said it was prejudicial to the defendant and to the defense theory and was clear error. The Commonwealth responded that the defense opened the door because they asked the witness why she provided the text messages to the state police and that her answer, during which she broke down, explained the pressure she felt as a result of the public's and defense's statements that were made against her and Colin Albert. The judge in ruling said she disagreed with the defense in, quote, the strongest way possible, and quickly denied the renewed motion. After that was put on the record, once the jury entered, Colin Albert retook the stand to begin his cross-examination. He denied speaking with anyone other than his attorney and Mr. Lolly, the prosecutor, a month ago when he was prepped for his testimony for the trial. He denied speaking with his parents about that meeting, about John's death, about the events of the night, everything. He denied reviewing any media coverage about the case. He denied speaking with a soul other than his lawyer and Mr. Lolly about the case. He pulled out the don't remember card and used it over and over and over. He said he didn't remember when last he spoke with his very best friend, Allie McCabe. But he was able to remember that two years ago, he left 34 Fairview at 12, 10 a.m. At this point, not even five minutes into his cross-examination, I personally gave up hope of getting any useful information from him. He lost all credibility to me as a witness because of his obvious evasiveness. Colin was asked about his relationship with Courtney Proctor. He said she, that he's been to her house four or five times and that his family was close, but not that close and that he was closer to her family more when he was younger. The defense showed him a picture, and after objections, he testified that, yes, he was a ring bearer about 10 years ago at Courtney's wedding, which established the closeness of the two families. He testified that Michael Proctor was also in that wedding party. He's known Michael since he was a little kid and knows where Michael, the lead investigator in this case, lives. Colin said he was never interviewed by Kenton police, but he was interviewed by the state police once in July, 2023. Who interviewed him? Michael Proctor and his partner. How long was he interviewed? About 10 minutes. Sounds very thorough, doesn't it? Next, defense brought up the text messages between him and Allie McCabe. They established that the witness was comfortable with texting and it was a preferred method of communication. We saw the text exchange that was introduced yesterday. The defense asked Colin about the gap in text messages from January 29th until February 20th when the next text appeared to be sent. Defense asked Colin, where are the texts between those two dates? He answered, they probably switched to another app, probably Snapchat to communicate. He said there was no reason for the switch. He admitted that he knows Snapchat, an app that allows for communication, has the ability to auto-delete messages if that function is selected. But of course, Colin did not remember if his Snapchat was set up with the auto-delete setting. He testified that he only provided the screenshot of the text exchange to Proctor. Proctor never asked to see the actual text messages. He never asked to do a phone extraction and never asked to see the metadata for the texts themselves. In September 2023, Proctor's partner, Yuri Buknik, contacted the witness asking him about the text messages, and he told Buknik that he didn't have them anymore 
but he had sent the screenshot to his dad. And if Buchnick wanted the screenshot, he'd have to get it from his dad. The witness denied remembering anything about that exchange with Buchnick. Surprisingly, the witness has the same phone now that he was using back in January 2022. Next, defense asked the witness about a photo that was shown yesterday of him that was taken in February 2022, so just a few days after the incident. He testified that there was nothing unusual about his appearance in the picture. He was then asked about a subsequent event during which pictures were taken on February 26th, so just about one month after John died. In that picture, the witness's right hand is prominently shown and his knuckles were scraped up. They looked red, but not like entirely fresh cuts. The photo was taken by a staff member at an event and posted on social media, so the photo wasn't in his control at all. Although he can't remember much of anything else, he very clearly remembered that he received the injuries to his knuckles at a house party. Get this. He said it was icy. He was walking up a steep driveway and he slipped down the driveway. He had something in his left hand, so he tried to brace himself with his right hand. When he hit the asphalt, he scraped the top of his knuckles. So he wants us to believe he braced himself by making a fist instead of palm side down. The defense was as incredulous as I was at this story because he said, seriously, which of course was sustained. The defense started asking Colin whether he'd been in any fights ever. Colin said, no, never. Other than tussles with his brothers, he's never fought anybody. He was then asked if he knew about some videos of him fighting. Immediately, we got the objection, sidebar, jury was dismissed, and we got into a voir dire. Because it wouldn't be a complete day without one, right? During the voir dire, with Colin still on the stand, defense played two videos. The first video was a short clip of Colin speaking directly to the camera with a backwards cap on, threatening to beat the advantage boys, rhymes with basses, promising to rhymes with truck them up, ending with pull up rhymes with pitch. The next video was kind of similar. The audio was terrible, but what could be deciphered was Colin saying, knocked out, KO, bang, bang. Colin testified that he recognized the videos and they were taken about three years ago. He admitted to what he said in the videos and that they were threatening words of violence. The defense asked him if he really was a violent person, to which he denied. But then the defense asked him whether he showed up to a hearing in July 2023, federal investigation, to testify, and at that time had busted up knuckles at that hearing. At that hearing, he was asked about his knuckles, and he said then he had been hitting a heavy weight bag for cardio. However, only the knuckles on his right hand were busted but not on his left hand. So maybe he was only training half his body that day. The prosecutor then asked who the threats in the videos were directed to. And he said they were made to the Advantage Boys, an ice, a club ice hockey team that had been texting him and his friends and calling them names. He said he never saw these team members face to face, didn't know their names or where they were from, never had any physical altercations with them. The parties finished the voir dire with arguments. The defense argued that the Commonwealth opened the door for the two short videos to be introduced to the jury as evidence. The Commonwealth previously asked witnesses about the physical appearance of Colin the night in question and whether he had visible injuries. This, the defense argued, opened the door to impeachment evidence of Colin's scraped knuckles on at least two occasions. Also, they argued that the witness tried to present himself to the jury as a peaceful person who had never been in a fight in his life. Yet the video showing the witness making threats of physical violence to people he didn't even know offers a different version of his personality. The voir dire finished and the judge allowed the videos to be shown to the jury. The line of questioning mirrored what we heard in the voir dire and the defense finished their cross-examination on that topic. 
On redirect, Colin testified that the prosecutor never spoke with him about not speaking with other people about his testimony. So he made that decision independently to not say a word about anything regarding the case to anybody that he knows. He said he was eight or nine at the time he was in Courtney Proctor's wedding, and he wasn't really close with Michael. Regarding the text messages, he testified that the month-long gap before the next te text with Ali McCabe was a normal amount of time that he'd go without texting her on iMessage. The Commonwealth asked Colin about the videos of him threatening the hockey team, and he said it all started over a girl. He maintained that he had he never had any negative interactions or arguments with John O'Keefe, and he testified that he never saw John at 34 Fairview the night in question. The witness was asked about comments made on the internet about him, and he said that a little over a year ago, people on social media started harassing him and his family and calling them murderers. His testimony concluded on that note. At least he didn't break down on the stand. The next witness was Matthew McCabe. He was at the waterfall the night in question with the group of friends. He knew John O'Keefe as the uncle who became his niece and nephew's guardian after their parents passed away. His daughter was friends with John's niece. They often had sleepovers and were in the same class at school. They were very close. His wife, Jen, helped John out from time to time with the kids with stuff like giving them rides. He first met Karen in 2020 when John brought her to their house for the kids to swim. John wanted the ladies to meet because he thought they would both bond over their shared MS diagnoses. So the men were friends, but not so close that they spoke to each other about their personal relationships. So as we've already heard, there was an invitation for the group at Waterfalls to go after party at 34 Fairview. Jen drove she and Matt to the house, but before leaving the lot, John O'Keefe sent her a text message asking for the address. The witness told her to call John instead of texting him back. The witness heard the conversation during which she provided the address and the witness chimed in with some directions. There was another call a few minutes later because John and his vehicle was lost. So Jen helped him again by giving additional directions. John replied by saying they, him and the defendant, were on their way to the house. The drive from Waterfall to 34 Fairview should have taken four to five minutes. Upon the witness getting to 34 Fairview, Jen pulled their car into the driveway and they went inside. It was about 1220-ish and they ended up leaving about 1-ish. The witness says that he never saw Colin Albert that night. His testimony about the atmosphere at the house party was similar to other testimony that we've already heard. He said that at some point he heard his wife offering to, to drive Julie Nagel home. And when Julie went outside the side door, to go outside to talk to her brother, somebody mentioned that there was another vehicle out front. He assumed it was John and Karen, and he either looked out the window or went to the front door to see the SUV. He said he saw a dark SUV directly in front of the house. He also saw other vehicles, the black SUV directly in front of the house, then behind it, a Jeep by the mailbox, then behind that, the truck that Julie went to. Now, side note about this Jeep. Yesterday, I said that we'd not heard about a Jeep before. Well, I was wrong. My bad. I went back into my notes and recall that there was testimony about a Jeep being driven by Brian Higgins. Nicole Albert testified that Higgins got to their house before them and had parked in the driveway. And when Brian Albert arrived, Higgins backed what she thought was a Jeep out of their driveway so that Brian Albert could park there. She testified that she wasn't sure where Higgins parked and Brian Albert Sr. also didn't remember and didn't see where Higgins parked. Back to Matt McCabe. He said he looked out again a few minutes later because it was weird John hadn't come inside the house yet. When he looked out the second time, the SUV had moved up closer to the edge of the property around the flagpole and utility box area. He looked out the door a third time, and this time he saw the SUV had pulled up even further and was now past the flagpole and utility box on the other side of the property line. 
He said after Julie came back inside the house, he saw some tire marks in the road in front of where the Jeep was and described them as looking like a weird wave. But he admitted that he did not observe what vehicle made the marks. He said he never saw anybody outside the vehicle, didn't see footprints around or leading away from the vehicle. He didn't see the inside of the vehicle and never noticed interior lights on inside the vehicle either. He looked out one more time, and that time the SUV was gone. From the first time seeing the SUV to the time he noticed the SUV was gone, it was at least 10 minutes. He testified that his wife was trying to communicate with John to let him know that he had arrived at the correct location, but that she didn't get a response back. The witness left 34 Fairview around 145. He drove his wife's car home and Julie and Sarah were in the back seats. Driving away from the house, he said the ladies were all talking and Jen was faced towards him. He did not see anything on the side of the road because he was focused on driving in the snow, which was coming down pretty good at that time. He said he got home around 2.15ish after dropping the girls off. Jen went upstairs before he did, but when he did, she was still awake. They spoke a little bit before he fell asleep. He said he woke up to screams in his bedroom on January 29th. And with that, the judge called it a day. So at the end of day 13, we are in the middle of Matt McCabe's direct testimony. He is the brother-in-law of Nicole and Brian Albert Sr., the homeowners of 34 Fairview, where John O'Keefe's body was found laying in the snow. He so far testified as to the communication between John and his wife, Jen, after leaving the Waterfall Bar, giving John the address and directions to 34 Fairview. Once there, he thought it was weird that John had not arrived yet. And when his attention was directed outside because Julie was going outside to speak with her brother, he looked outside and noticed a dark SUV as well as a Jeep and the truck that Julie was going out to meet. He testified that he noticed the black SUV or the dark SUV move positions three times over a roughly 15 minute period, yet John O'Keefe never came inside the house. He himself drove past the house on his way home during which time someone in his car pointed something suspicious out, yet he didn't follow up on it. We don't know why, but nobody else did either. So we have yet another day with a full day of testimony and still no answers as to what happened to John O'Keefe, the victim here. I think we're pretty certain that he got to 34 Fairview, but what happened? Did he go inside the house or not? Things are not looking so good for the Commonwealth, in my opinion, we are 13 days in and the evidence to substantiate their allegations is scant and the doubt is flying all over the place. But we'll be back tomorrow for another full day of testimony and I will be bringing you the recap once that is completed. Thanks so much for joining me today. Don't forget, if you've missed out on any of the recaps, feel free to check out the playlist. They are all in a playlist since day one of the trial. I hope you are enjoying the coverage that I'm providing, and I hope to see you again soon. All right, until the next drop, peace.